Tonight's program is the third lecture in a series that explores the intersection of visual art, natural history, and environmental science. Uh, the series has been organized in conjunction with the current exhibition, Alexis Rockman, A Fable T for Tomorrow, which is on view in our third floor galleries. Um, and is really, the lecture series is really inspired by Rockman's own cross-disciplinary approach to art making. So this series, which we're calling the Art and Science Science lecture series uh, will continue later, uh, well, excuse me, not later this month, but into the month of March and April as well, um, with s lectures by Steve Monfort uh, on March 30th, who is with the, the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. Um, Rhonda Roland Shearer uh, will be here on April 19th. She's with the Art and Science Laboratory out of New York City. And then Christiane Samper, director of the National Museum for Natural History uh, here at the Smithsonian, will be speaking on April 27th. And and all of those dates are listed on our spring calendar, which is available just outside the auditorium. So I encourage you to pick one up uh, on your way out this evening. Uh, now on to our program. Our speaker this evening brings a really unique perspective to the theme of art and science. He is a longtime friend of Alexis Rockman's uh, and a contributing author to the exhibition catalog, Alexis Rockman, A Fable for Tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Thomas E. Lovejoy is with us tonight. He's currently serving as Biodiversity Chair at the Heinz Center for Science, Economics, and the Environment uh, here in Washington, D.C., where he also served as president of that organization from 2002 to 2008. Prior to joining the Heinz Center, Dr. Lovejoy was the World Bank's chief biodiversity advisor and also served as senior advisor to the president of the United Nations Foundation. Lovejoy sat on science and environmental committees under the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations, and in 2001 was awarded the prestigious Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. He has long-standing ties to the Smithsonian Institution, serving as Assistant Secretary and Counselor to the Secretary of the Smithsonian in past. Uh, he also conceived the idea of the Minimal Critical Size of Ecosystems Project, did I get that right? Um, which was a joint project between the Smithsonian and Brazil's National in Institute for Amazonian Research. Uh, for nearly 40 years, um, Lovejoy has maintained a research camp in the Amazon where he regularly hosts politicians, celebrities, and individuals who are eager to learn about the rainforest and how it's changing. Um, he's also originated the concept of debt for nature swaps and is founder of the PBS series Nature. Uh, in March, and finally, uh, this is so a long, long list of accolades. Um, in March, he was elected to the faculty of George Mason University um, as professor of biocomplexity and ecology in the Department of en Environmental Science and Policy. It is my pleasure to welcome Tom Lovejoy to the podium. Thank you, Joanna. So. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here this evening uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the art and the science behind the art of Alexis. Uh, and, and this is a really interesting topic for somebody who is first and foremost a scientist to put together. Uh, but it really is First of all, it's, it's a tale of two New York City boys, uh, about 20 years apart. <laughs> uh, and it's also a story about museums and art and science uh, and some of the commonalities uh, between art and science. Because in the last analysis, uh, we have evolved as a social primate whose most highly developed sense is the visual sense. So uh, some kinds of science, including my kind of science, uh, really have a big visual element in it. Other parts are more abstract, but I think the conceptual kinds of thinking that 
goes on in that kind of science, in a sense, is an abstraction uh, of the visual sense. So let me take you through this uh, story here, and we'll sort of go back and forth between uh, some of the uh, images in the catalog and in the exhibition and some of the science uh, that relates to all of it. So both of us grew up in New York City. Uh, both of us uh, were strongly influenced by the American Museum of Natural History. This is its Central Park entrance. Uh, also a memorial to President Theodore Roosevelt uh, with very uh, significant statements of, of Roosevelt inside in, in the memorial itself about how this nation needed to be much more sensible and forward-looking in the management of nature and natural resources. So Alexis was there because his mother actually worked at the American Museum uh, for the famous anthropologist uh, Margaret Mead. Uh, I would haunt the museum uh, just because it was one of the great places to go as a kid in New York uh, with these extraordinary dioramas uh, as here in the Akeley Hall of, of African uh, nature. Uh, the dioramas themselves being a fascinating art form, uh, largely uh, no longer practiced, uh, and uh, they've become so beloved uh, in the museums that have them uh, that nobody would ever imagine uh, replacing them uh, with something else. Uh, so this is another one of them in the Hall of North American Mammals uh, of grizzly bears. Uh, but in my case, while I was fascinated by nature and what I could learn by wandering through the halls of the Natural History Museum, uh, it was a biology teacher who really ignited my lifelong passion uh, about nature and then later conservation. Uh, and the story is completely true that the year before I went to the Millbrook School and studied with this biology teacher, the big fat envelope came saying how many socks to bring and things like that. And it said you had to take biology in the first or second year. Uh, and with enormous prescience, I announced to my parents that I would take it the first year and get it over with. Uh, well, three weeks with this teacher just was transformative. Uh, and I realized just two or three years ago, thinking back on that first year, that he actually taught a course about biological diversity. Because he started with blue-green algae in the fall, peering down a microscope, uh, and ended up with mammals in the spring. Uh, and even though biological diversity as a term had not come into existence and would not until 1980, uh, basically that's what it was. And all the other parts of biology were hung on in appropriate places along the way. Uh, and to excite me even further, uh, that teacher had started a zoo. Uh, so here I am at the age of 15, literally feeding horse meat uh, to a cheetah. So once that interest had been ignited, I truly began to haunt the halls of all natural history museums, including uh, the one in New York. Uh, and so basically, I think what ignited Alexis on his artistic trajectory uh, and myself uh, on my scientific trajectory was an enormous appreciation for the variety of life on Earth, uh, what Charles Darwin called endless forms, uh, all beautiful. Uh, and it's really interesting to think about how this plays back and forth between art and science, uh, which in certain ways seem to, be, seem to be completely antithetical. 
science supposedly very analytical uh, and uh, painting, in this particular case, painting, drawing, uh, very sort of a matter of creative expression. But in the end, uh, the visual elements are really important to at least my end of biology. Uh, and science has strong elements of creativity uh, in it itself. Uh, just new ways of thinking about things, new ideas, uh, are a creative process much in the same way uh, as an artist applies uh, his imagination uh, to a canvas or a piece of paper. So uh, this is one of uh, Alexis's uh, paintings. Uh, and I start with it, it's called The Forest Floor because it's, it's actually very close to an exhibit in the American Museum of Natural History uh, in which the earthworm is about that big around uh, and you're looking uh, at the, the creatures both above, above and below the, the surface of the soil uh, as well as the, the plants and the microorganisms. Uh, and that's also a good way to be thinking about the importance of biological diversity uh, in the way that I do as a scientist and Alexis does as an artist. Uh, because in the end, we are part of a living planet uh, and the soils, which Americans unfortunately usually just call dirt <laughs> as opposed to earth, are actually a living environment. Uh, and so the long history of life on earth is about the increasing uh, uh, variety of life on Earth, uh, invasion of, of parts of the planet that previously had no life in them. Uh, we now know it goes down at least a couple miles below the surface of the Earth. Uh, we know that the composition of the atmosphere was set by the previous history of life on Earth and what currently goes on. Uh, so, uh, Inevitably, when you're interested in the variety of, of living things, you get drawn to tropical rainforest uh, because it is the most diverse, the richest in life forms of all the ecosystems on the planet. And uh, this is um, Alexis's painting called The Conversation. Uh, it's somewhat fanciful uh, because the ape involved in this conversation uh, does not occur in the new world. Uh, and Alexis on the left uh, is sort of imagining community, communing with nature, uh, which he first really experienced in the tropics uh, by going uh, to the country of Guyana, uh, one of the three former colonies, uh, the three Guianas, Suriname being former Dutch Guiana. And most people don't realize the reason New Amsterdam became New York is because uh, the Dutch traded it to the British uh, for Suriname because the tropical colony was a very wealthy producing, wealth producing colony compared to a uh, temperate zone one. So there is Dutch Guiana, and then let's see, you go across the, from west to east across the top of South America, it's Venezuela, and then it's Guyana, and then it's Suriname, or former Dutch Guyana, and then finally French Guiana, uh, which is still a department of France. Uh, the French very cleverly defined themselves out of being a colonial power. Uh, which is very convenient for the neighboring Brazilian state uh, of Amapá because it qualifies for European Union money because it is a neighbor of Europe. One of these curious bits of geography. In any case, uh, Guyana today has a pop population of 750,000 and it is still largely intact. Uh, 
and the tropical forests are rich and they're beautiful. Uh, they've attracted naturalists there uh, uh, for literally um, at least a couple centuries. Uh, this is one of the most famous ones from the first part of the 20th century, William Beebe of the New York Zoological Society, uh, pictured here in Guyana in 1917. Uh, it also was the place that uh, Rudolf Zallinger went, <coughs> uh, probably, I would guess, in the 60s when he was doing uh, illustrations for the Time Life book on tropical rainforests. Um, and Rudy was somebody I actually got to know as an undergraduate at Yale. Uh, he was, was famous, will always be famous for this mural for which he received the Pulitzer Prize uh, called The Age of Dinosaurs, which is in a museum, the Peabody Museum of Natural History at Yale. Uh, so in any case, Guyana was a logical place to go uh, to illustrate uh, and paint the intricacies of a tropical rainforest, which is really important because it's so, so hard to do photography in a tropical rainforest. You're dealing with sometimes like 1% of daylight uh, at the forest floor, uh, which means that a little light speck that somehow made it down from the canopy uh, would literally be 100 times brighter. So that's a real challenge to photography. On top of it, everything's hiding from everything else. Uh, so seeing things is not easy. Uh, and the great advantage of doing it as illustration uh, is you can put things into the illustration that you might have seen several days before, uh, uh, but wouldn't be there on any particular day. Uh, so I also remember Rudy telling me that they basically sat around in their camp doing the illustrations wearing pajamas uh, because that was the easiest way to scratch the ants, uh, which were everywhere. So this is one of Alexis's paintings uh, from Guyana. Uh, it's called a Bromeliad uh, at Kayatur Falls, uh, one of the six major destination waterfalls of the world. Uh, I had the great delight of actually visiting it about three weeks ago. Uh, and it is, it is quite staggering and has none of the crowds of Niagara. Uh, in any case, for those of you who haven't actually dealt much or thought much about bromeliads, uh, they actually are mostly found in the tops of trees in the tropical rainforests, uh, where this whorl of leaves actually enables them to have a little pool of water inside. Uh, and an original adaptation to living in a very dry environment, uh, sandy places along the coast of Brazil. Uh, pineapple is a bromeliad. But most of them are like this one, uh, up in the forest canopy with basically little froggy swimming pools uh, and other, other kinds of things living in them. And it's part of the richness of tropical forests, how life builds upon life. Uh, so in many ways, the Guyana forests are simply an extension uh, of the Amazon forests, uh, which I was lured to uh, in 1965. Uh, this is just a photograph looking at the canopy of the forest with mist in it, uh, quite sort of similar to uh, a Martin Heed Johnson painting of a Cattleya orchid uh, with three hummingbirds. Uh, in any case, in 1965, the Amazon, which is essentially the size of the 48 states, much bigger than you would think looking on a map because the Mercator projection uh, exaggerates things north and south of the equator and minimizes things on the equator. Uh, at that time, there were three million people and one road in the entire Amazon. So 
that drew me, you know, like a moth to a candle, uh, much as, as Alexis was drawn uh, to the extension of that forest in Guyana. Uh, but as one begins to look at Alexis's work, uh, you begin to see uh, the effects of the human species on the natural world. Uh, this is one called the concrete jungle. And it's basically about how in the places where humanity has had the strongest impact on nature, uh, there tends to be a sorting out of species. And a lot of species that uh, have very complex life cycles uh, have long lifespans, uh, are at a serious disadvantage, and those that get along easily in marginal environments and reproduce quickly do very well. So it's a sorting out uh, in favor of the weeds. Uh, and so much as Alexis was beginning to think about the impact of humanity uh, on nature, uh, I fell into a job in 1973 working for a tiny organization called the World Wildlife Fund, where I became employee number 13 uh, with one assistant. Uh, the entire program was $350,000, uh, and we were supposed to take care of just about every conservation problem you might think of. Uh, so my attention began to be directed towards some of the same things uh, that Alexis' attention went to, uh, even though a little bit later. Uh, and one of the, the major ways in which we affect the world, and I'm not going to give you a long catalog uh, because this is not an environmental science lecture, uh, but one of the major ways that we affect uh, life on Earth is by introducing species, either deliberately or accidentally to places where they don't naturally occur, uh, and then the natural defenses uh, don't really work. So one of the things we uh, do is introduce our domesticated animals, domestic animals, and so cats are often one of those. Uh, and so in this particular case, the Stephen Island wren uh, is only known uh, from a uh, very small number of specimens, all collected by the, Saint St the Stephen Island uh, Lightkeeper's cat. Um, and this is not just something that occurs on, in terrestrial environments, it occurs in aquatic ones as well. Uh, so this really beautiful comb jelly uh, is probably about that big in nature, uh, but just a beautiful uh, organism uh, is native to the Atlantic waters of uh, the Western Hemisphere, and somehow it got into the ballast water of ships, and some of them ended up in the Black Sea uh, about 1980. Uh, and within uh, just a very few years, certainly less than 10, uh, they had exploded uh, in population, uh, had sort of undercut the food chain uh, and basically undermined a quarter of a billion dollar fishery uh, in the Black Sea. So there are endless examples of this going on, uh, which I won't drag you all through, uh, but you will see later this theme uh, show up uh, in one of Alex's paintings. So there I was at the World Wildlife Fund uh, trying to deal with various ways in which we were affecting life on Earth. Uh, and at the time I went there, uh, attention had just begun to focus on a change that had been going on for a very long time, but nobody had paid any attention to. So you know, everybody always talks about the destruction of habitat, uh, but it was only uh, really in the late 60s and then uh, early 70s that people began to, to recognize that the problem was not just the destruction of habitat, uh, it was the following kind of sequence. So here we're looking at 
uh, Atlantic forest in the state of Bahia, uh, in the south of the state of Bahia uh, in Brazil. This is 1945. Uh, this is 1960. And this is 1990. Uh, and it probably looks a little bit better now because some efforts have been made to do some reforestation. But the point is, habitat gets fragmented in the course of human occupation of the landscape. And it's not just something that occurs in the tropics, it occurs most every place. Uh, so this is that same kind of sequence in a uh, township in Wisconsin, going from essentially continuous forest in 1831 uh, to a bunch of fragments in 1950. Anyway, nobody had been p paying particular attention to what went on in the fragments. Uh, and as I was finishing my PhD and then ending up at the World Wildlife Fund, people had begun uh, to notice that actually fragmentation itself caused problems. And one of those uh, first bits of evidence came from the Smithsonian's Tropical Research Institute, uh, which has uh, a field station on Barrow, Colorado in the middle of Gatun Lake in the Canal Zone. Uh, originally it was called the Canal Zone Biological Station, uh, but as time went on it became a Smithsonian uh, facility uh, and today is part of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Uh, so before Gatun Lake, Barrow, Colorado was just basically uh, an enormous Panamanian hilltop. Uh, but once the lake filled, it became an island uh, surrounded by water, uh, a habitat fragment of a sort. Uh, and a lot of biologists uh, went to uh, this place because it was a wonderful place to study tropical nature. So there's a long sort of sequence of data that was being produced by these scientists and happily there was enough continuity uh, that you could begin to make some comparisons over time. So <laughs> shortly after the island was created in the 1920s, it was known that there were 208 species of birds on that island. Uh, and by 1970, 45 of those no longer occurred there. Uh, and in one of the early papers about the impacts of fragmentation, uh, the analysis concluded that at least 18 of those had vanished just because Barrow, Colorado was not big enough. Uh, so suddenly there was this pipsqueak biologist running the program of the World Wildlife Fund uh, realizing that there was this problem about habitat fragments, which basically said you don't really know whether these projects that are going to the board for approval will actually be successful in the longer term. Because once something is no longer part of continuous wilderness, it tends to simplify and lose species. Uh, so it was a really, really hot argument uh, of the kind that goes on in science when there are no direct data, had bi big implications for how one designed projects to conserve biological diversity, uh, design national parks, manage national parks. Uh, and in December 1976, uh, when I was still at the World Wildlife Fund, uh, uh, as part of ongoing worrying about what did this all mean uh, for how we should do conservation, uh, it occurred to me in sort of a really wild idea uh, that maybe you could persuade, this is the actual thought that went through my head, maybe you could persuade the Brazilians uh, to arrange the 50% which they require stay in rainforest uh, in any project in the Amazon to have a giant experiment where we would study uh, what ultimately became fragments before they were fragments, have fragments of different size. 
Uh, and this is that project uh, at the very beginning, uh, which does connect with Alexis uh, in a very interesting way. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about that project and then show you a bit of his art, uh, which relates to all of that. So one of the best examples uh, one, can, one can provide about how this all works involves uh, army ants, uh, which occur in colonies of half a million to a million ants. Uh, it's quite awesome. Uh, you can literally hear it, because uh, when the ants are uh, not in the bivouac state, but in the other part of their three-week cycle are in a swarming state, going up and down small tree trunks and through the leaf litter looking mostly for insect prey, uh, it's actually audible. Because if you think about it, you got half a million ants and six legs per ant, uh, and it you know collectively makes uh, an impressive noise. And I had the, the, uh, the interesting privilege to show the, the legendary English ecologist Charles Elton uh, his first army ant swarm, and he called it the most macabre ecological event he'd ever seen, uh, which then begins to get you to the, the perspective where some of these things actually are surreal, surreal in Alexis's art, surreal in terms of what we're doing in nature, and sometimes just surreal uh, in their own natural state. So you have these army ants going through a three-week cycle, uh, and there are a whole bunch of bird species that follow the army ants around and make their living entirely by, by swooping down and catching some of the fleeing insects before the ants get to them. Uh, so that has become uh, a research project that is now in its 33rd year. Uh, as Joanna mentioned, it's a joint project uh, between the Smithsonian and the Tropical Research Institute on the American side and Brazil's National Institute for Amazon Research uh, in Manaus in Brazil. Uh, and the number of long-term research projects in nature anywhere are very short. Uh, so as this one began to approach something like 20 years, it was quite an exception. Uh, and Natural History Magazine, published by the American Museum, uh, decided it would devote a whole issue. Uh, and knowing that it would be hard to illustrate with photographs, they recruited Alexis uh, to go down and do some illustration. So this is one of the illustrations he did for the magazine. It's called uh, Fragment. Uh, you're looking at the top of a forest fragment uh, with a, a little marmoset and a tanager. Uh, you can see a road cutting across uh, on the right-hand side, uh, cleared forest in the distance, uh, and forest at fire from deforestation uh, on the horizon. So that was uh, my second sort of real moment of contact with Alexis. Uh, the first had been when he sent me the catalog of his work from the Guyana trip, uh, just out of the blue. Uh, and in this case, uh, there he was uh, illustrating the very work that I was involved with uh, and doing it with that same sort of wide-eyed sort of sense of surrealism about human impact uh, on nature. Uh, I really wanted to buy this painting. <laughs> uh, by the time I got around to asking, it had already been sold. Uh, and I was, as I was saying to Joanna, I think, uh, it's probably just as well, because I never would have been able to afford it. <laughs> so, uh, so Alexis and I knew a lot about each other, but it was only until maybe three years ago uh, that we finally met. Uh, and again, it was, it was around uh, his sense of what humanity was actually doing to the natural world. Some of it gets uh, summed up in this painting, 
uh, which he calls the recent history of the world. Uh, and it includes uh, things like uh, animals driven to extinction, like the quagga, uh, the zebra relative in the southern part of Africa, uh, invasive species like the Philippine brown tree snake, uh, which basically came close to causing a number of extinctions when it made it to, to Guam. And it is a very invasive snake. Uh, it frequently will get up into the, the, uh, the well of aircraft where, where uh, the wheels get tucked away for flight uh, and then just drop out in a new location after landing. Uh, it's also about rats, pigs, and other domestic uh, creatures uh, affecting native fauna, in this case, uh, rails and other native species on, on islands in the Pacific. Uh, a lot of the Hawaiian honey creepers, which have been driven to extinction uh, as a consequence. Uh, and so it, many of the things that, that we are doing to the natural world are sort of summed up in this painting. Uh, but there's one big factor uh, which he later turned his attention to, uh, as did I, uh, which is really not in this painting. Uh, and that's the whole issue of climate change. Uh, <clears throat> and what most people don't realize uh, is how old the science of climate change really is. Uh, and it basically goes back to a paper written in 1896 by this Swedish scientist. And what he was really doing was asking the question, why is the planet a habitable temperature for humans and other forms of life? I mean, why isn't it too cold? Uh, why is it okay for all living things uh, at the moment? Uh, and the answer was the presence of greenhouse gases, otherwise the planet would be seriously uh, cold to a point that humans couldn't live there uh, and much of uh, current life on Earth uh, could not, although I'm sure the microorganisms would have plenty that would survive under those circumstances. Uh, so he published that paper in 1896. He actually calculated with pencil and paper what doubling pre-industrial levels of CO2 would do to the planetary temperature it is unbelievably close uh, to what the big fancy supercomputer climate models uh, uh, estimate it would be. Uh, but what he did not know uh, was any detail of the temperature of the Earth for the previous, say, in this case, 120,000 years. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of abrupt climate change going on. But the most important thing is this little last 10,000 years, a period of unusual stability uh, in the planet's climate. Uh, and that includes all recorded history, a uh, certain amount of unrecorded human history, the origins of agriculture, the origin of human settlements, basically makes the point that the entire human enterprise is based on the assumption of a stable climate. Uh, and in that same 10,000 years, of course, all nature uh, has been adjusting to a stable climate. And that is now changing uh, because we're pushing up uh, the levels of CO2 and other greenhouse gases uh, beyond anything in the recent history of the planet. Uh, and the Earth's climate system is responding. So today we're like three quarters of a degree warmer than in pre-industrial times. Really doesn't sound like a lot, but it is for ecosystems that have spent 10,000 years adjusting to a stable climate. So we're seeing a lot of changes as a consequence, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on it. Uh, happens to be something I've specialized on for 25 years, but I'm not going to subject you to all of that. Uh, but one example is there are a number of glaciers on high peaks in the tropics like Kilimanjaro, uh, and all tropical glaciers are receding at a rate that they will be gone in 15 years. So that's a good 
measure of what's going on and how sensitive nature is to all of these things in just the physical sense. Uh, and we're also seeing movement all over the world uh, in terms of where species occur. Uh, so this is one of the two best known species of butterflies in North America, the Edis checker spot, and it's clearly been moving northward and upward uh, in altitude uh, in recent years in response uh, to the climate change that's already taking place. Um, so I'm not going to go into a lot more of all of that except to point out uh, some couple really drastic things that are already happening. Uh, and one involves the forests of Western North America. We're looking at uh, British Columbia at the moment. You're looking at annual outbreaks of the native pine bark beetle. And over this period of time, you'll see what originally were really small outbreaks get larger and larger because the winters are milder. Although in 1985, there was a cold winter, but it didn't knock them back for long. Uh, and they're now able to get in, t in two generations in a summer. So they're vast parts of the coniferous forests of Western North America, uh, which basically are 70% dead trees. And nobody quite knows uh, what the future of those ecosystems will be. Uh, so another one of the major changes uh, involves uh, the tropical coral reefs. Uh, incredibly diverse, incredibly productive, incredibly beautiful sort of technicolor world of huge importance to the 5% of humanity uh, which lives within a hundred meter of tropical coral reefs. And basically when I was a graduate student uh, and Alexis was probably in short pants, uh, all tropical coral reefs looked like this. Uh, unless they've been really hammered with sedimentation or something like that. Uh, in 1984, the first indication of the impacts of climate change um, appeared. <clears throat> and basically, only short periods of time of elevated temperature uh, are enough to seriously affect coral reefs. And it goes at the heart of what a coral reef ecosystem which is, is all about, which is a partnership between a coral animal and an alga. Uh, and so with relatively little increase in temperature for relatively modest lengths of time, the coral animal will eject the alga and then you get what are known as bleaching events. And the entire technicolor world goes black and white, the diversity and the productivity crash uh, and the welfare and the economy of those people depending on the tropical coral reefs uh, is in severe trouble. So the point I want to make here is we're already seeing at three quarters of a degree some really abrupt changes uh, in natural ecosystems. We're also seeing the beginnings of uh, some even larger changes. Uh, and one of these involves the Amazon rainforest and the way moisture is generated and moves around the planet. Uh, I'm absolutely mesmerized by uh, this uh, video, which goes hour by hour through an entire year, which I will not subject you to. Uh, but basically, you can see that most of the moisture is generated <coughs> at the equator and over the oceans. Uh, and the major exception is here, where moisture comes off the Atlantic and goes into the Amazon and then uh, in a process which is very well scientifically understood, it has a hydrological cycle which keeps generating rain as it moves westward until it finally hits the high wall of the Andes uh, and a huge uh, proportion of that moisture then drops as rain and creates the Amazon drainage which is 20% of the world's river water. Uh, and also some of it goes north and, and some of it goes south and actually is hugely important for Brazil's ag agro industry. In any case, uh, one of the major computer models suggested some years ago uh, that that could break down. And that in fact is what happened in 2005 
and again repeated this last year, uh, historic drought periods. And basically, not enough moisture was coming off the Atlantic. Uh, it's probably a preview of what climate change can bring. Uh, and there are other exacerbating factors that I won't go into, which actually mean that the Amazon forest in the south and the east are close to a tipping point, uh, happily one that can be avoided by building back a margin of safety uh, and doing some reforestation. Uh, but it is, a, it is an indication of how uh, just really small changes in the average temperature uh, and the way moisture then moves around the planet uh, can have major effects. Uh, and the other one I want to draw your attention to is that all that extra CO2 in the atmosphere has actually been making the oceans become more acid, uh, something that science overlooked until six years ago. Uh, so basically, the oceans today are a tenth of a pH unit more acid than in pre-industrial times. Doesn't sound like much, but it's one of those logarithmic curves, so it means it's 30 percent uh, more acid. Uh, and the the real implications are for those animals that build shells and skeletons out of calcium carbonate. Uh, so uh, basically, the more acid it is, the harder it is for those organisms to build shells or skeletons. Some of them we know about, like corals uh, or giant clams. Uh, some most people don't know about, which are these tiny little organisms that exist in huge numbers. Uh, and are at the base of some of the important uh, marine food chains. Uh, and I'm going to show you one of these now, uh, a marvelous little animal, which is actually a snail in which the foot on which a snail usually slides around uh, has been modified so it's two little wing-like flaps uh, which allow it to uh, maintain itself in the water column. And so they're known as sea butterflies, and that's how they behave. Uh, and they turn out to be uh, very sensitive to acidity. Uh, so their actual observed effects uh, in the food chains, food chain bases off Alaska and uh, the North Atlantic. So enough on climate change, but that's what lies behind uh, one of Alexis's uh, most celebrated works of art, uh, his vision of the Brooklyn waterfront uh, with climate change and sea level rise uh, manifest destiny. Uh, an extraordinarily sort of disturbing painting, uh, very creative, very imaginative, uh, surreal in many senses. Uh, and it's uh, Really great to be able to see it at full scale uh, on exhibit uh, here at American Art because all I'd ever seen before was a print about that size. Uh, and so when you think about the kinds of things that Alexis is trying to illustrate about our effects on nature, uh, in the end it's climate change, which is probably the biggest of all. Uh, it leads to this series of paintings like this one called The Dirt Road about uh, big storm events. There's still a little scientific debate about that, but it's getting closer and closer, I think, to being confirmed that extreme weather events are part of the consequence of all of this. So uh, in the end, you could end up with a really sort of Ozymandian view of the future. Uh, as exemplified by this series of paintings he has, including this one called Capitol Hill. Uh, what it's going to all look like after we've made the world so miserable that most of us aren't around anymore. Uh, but there is absolutely no reason it has to be that way. And that's the important message uh, that I want to leave with you beyond sort of this fascinating interplay between environmental science uh, and art. Uh, so one of the things that most people are unaware of is that of all the annual emissions of CO2 accumulating uh, uh, on the earth, maybe 15 to 20 percent of it actually comes from tropical deforestation. 
Uh, and the one really successful element in all the recent climate change negotiations has been to actually develop a program to reduce emissions uh, from uh, deforestation and forest degradation. Very good piece of news, uh, but that's only a piece of what one can actually do. Uh, and so this is what happens basically every year. Uh, the numbers vary a little bit from year to year, but the vast majority of the emissions come from burning fossil fuels in the lower left. Uh, maybe something like a fifth or maybe 15% of that from tropical deforestation and burning. Uh, and then the emissions uh, get partly absorbed by the land, partly by the oceans, and partly by the atmosphere. Uh, in fact, if you look at the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere today, roughly half of the accumulation uh, comes from what we have done to ecosystems in the past two or 300 years, not just tropical forests, what we've done to grasslands, what we've done to temperate forests, the uh, way we conduct agriculture. Uh, and so there's probably maybe 200, 250, 300 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere from what we've done to the nature over the past three centuries. Uh, and the good news is that some of that can come back out. Uh, so we're not necessarily uh, facing a manifest destiny. Uh, so the big issue, of course, is those gases stay up there for a long time, 100 to 1,000 years. Uh, and the question is, is there a way to pull them out? And it's essentially the reverse of what I've just been uh, telling you about destruction and degradation of living ecosystems. Uh, so twice in the history of life on Earth, uh, there have been very high levels of CO2 in the atmosphere brought down to pre-industrial levels. Uh, and the first time that happened uh, was when plants emerged on land, second time when modern flowering plants uh, uh, appeared and did it all more efficiently. Uh, but the point to be made is it wasn't just the green plants doing it. Uh, it was a biodiversity symphony working away at this, including all the organisms in the soil, uh, the fungi that provide nutrients to green plants. Uh, and so uh, what I am pursuing these days and what may be my ultimate quixotic dream is actually engaging in a reverse of that process at scale uh, according to the problem. Uh, so basically I'm talking about thinking of restoring ecosystems at a planetary scale, uh, still living room, for people uh, to do agriculture uh, and for the other purposes we need to use the land for. Uh, but in the process, over a half a century, maybe pulling a significant fraction of the excess CO2 in the atmosphere back out, uh, putting it into living ecosystems, making them more resilient to the other things we're doing to nature, including the climate change that uh, will come from the other excess CO2 uh, and basically regreening the emerald planet uh, by using the living planet to make the planet more habitable. Uh, so in the end, all of this probably seems very surreal, what we're doing to the planet, uh, but also that we could even think about managing the planet at the scale I'm just talking about. Uh, but those discussions have begun already to happen, uh, uh, even if informally and sort of in small intellectual settings. Uh, so in the end, uh, this interplay between art and human behavior uh, and science, some of which uh, is surreal, uh, is a wonderful sort of reflection of the kinds of things that Alexis art uh, combines. Uh, and so I just wanted to, at the end, give you an example or two uh, uh, about how nature and art can interact uh, with surprising 
uh, consequences, uh, beneficial consequences for humanity. And one of them involves this uh, extraordinary water lily, the giant water lily of, of the Amazon. I mean, you get a sense of the scale uh, of this plant. And the underside of the giant water lily has this extraordinary structure, ribs and sort of cross connections and girders. And this is uh, no longer an ancient black and white version, but uh, one I took maybe 20 years ago in the Amazon. Uh, and that structure uh, was very intriguing to a man named Joseph Paxton, who was the head gardener for the Duke of Devonshire. Uh, and it inspired him to do one of those experiments that mothers really don't like. <laughs> and he, he put a large copper lid on one of these lily pads and then uh, put their daughter on top of the copper lid. Uh, and behold, it held the entire 60 pounds. Uh, and this is all documented in the London Illustrated News. Uh, this is not a fanciful story. Uh, and he was a very creative uh, guy and began to think, you know, it might be interesting to design a glass house for uh, the Duke's giant water lilies, taking the design principles straight from the underside of uh, the giant water lily. Uh, and that, in fact, he did. And that, in turn, became uh, his inspiration for his design for the Crystal Palace, the great London exhibition of 1851. Uh, and there's another view of it, which essentially is the origin of modern metal beam architecture. Uh, so literally something on the order of half the buildings in the world uh, all derived from the underside of the giant water lily. Uh, and it fascinates me that when the wealthy rubber barons in Manaus uh, asked Eiffel to design them an iron market, uh, which he did, it was actually the giant water lily uh, coming home. So uh, in the end, I think one of the really important things that should give us hope about our sort of interaction uh, with the environment coming out in a better way uh, than Alexis tries to warn us about uh, is the very fascination with organic form uh, which propelled both of us uh, on our uh, professional careers. Uh, and the story I like to, to tell, uh, which sort of talks about to this point of the inspirational value of nature, uh, involves this uh, flowering shrub called Franklinia, which hasn't been seen in the wild since, I believe, 1804. Uh, and there was a, an illiterate, all close to illiterate uh, Pennsylvania farmer named John Bartram in the early part of the 18th century uh, who was out plowing one day and he was giving his mule a rest and his gaze fell on some kind of daisy kind of flower. Uh, and he looked at it in a way he'd never looked at a flower before. Uh, and I don't know what you said in the early 18th century, but it blew his mind. <laughs> uh, and right then and there, he decided he wanted to be a botanist, which meant he had to become literate, had to become literate in Latin. Uh, and because of Benjamin Franklin's help, he ended up uh, as royal botanist for the colonies uh, and later named this plant in gratitude to Franklin. So I believe that capacity exists in every human being. Uh, not just the Alexis the artist types or uh, the Tom the science types. Uh, and that to the extent that uh, we can take something which has long been appreciated in art and think how much organic form actually appears in art, you know, how much it is in Gaudi's architecture, for example. Uh, if we can just get people in this a frenzied world uh, to uh, put aside their blackberries for longer than an evening lecture and actually look at nature 
uh, I think we'll end up with a much better future uh, for all humanity. So thank you very much. So we have time for a few questions, I think. But we're really close to the hour. Yes, sir. The microphone's there. Phil? In observing and documenting the ebb and flow of life on the planet, and um, I just think you know you did a wonderful job of of of, of conveying the fact that we've dug up the Carboniferous period and short circuit the geologic carbon cycle, and we're heating the planet. But what's so vexing <coughs> is that you know there is this variability that you also pointed out that you know, is, is vexing in our ability to really point to any one particular impact of that heating of the planet and say, we can attribute the heating of the planet to that. And that's a hard part of communicating to people and getting the, their partnership and understanding the reality that this climate change is, is affecting our planet now and will continue to. But with Alexis's help, and you know, I really see that what's so nice about work of artists like Alexis is that it really brings to fruition the whole idea that E.O. Wilson has presented in his book Consilience about the way that we can solve these problems facing humanity by bringing together all of the forms of, exp of human yeah. expression. And so I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit on that partnership that com of communicating and solving these problems, uh, as E.O. Wilson pointed out in uh, his Consilience concept. Yeah. So, so I think there are the two things I'd say in response to that, uh, which I would hope uh, would be meaningful to this audience. One is uh, that contrary to what most people think, uh, this planet works not just as a physical system, but as a linked biological and physical system. Uh, and all the wonderful biological diversity of life that you can appreciate as an artist or you can benefit from because it producing the clean water for New York City uh, has to be factored in in how we think about managing home. Uh, but beyond that, uh, it really is important to cross boundaries uh, and form partnerships with different points of view, uh, different kinds of talents and abilities, uh, so that's, that's why I went to public television and it turned out that it was the nature series. Uh, it's not gonna do the world a lot of good if the scientists just sit around and talk to themselves. Uh, and Alexis is a wonderful example of somebody who takes that much farther. Yes. Um, at this hour of the evening, I, I loved your presentation. At this hour of the evening, maybe this isn't actually a question with an immediate response, but uh, sort of a thought that brings together two points you made when you talked about that giant water lily and, as sort of presaging what we now call biomimicry, you know, uh, all kinds of engineering and architectural design that's based on natural forms. And then what you described as your, your, your sort of latest uh, <laughs> venture, which I find fascinating is, uh, you know, how can you put, you know, how can you uh, restore enough of, of Earth's natural systems and still have room to live? Um, and I think that'd be a fast, so, so, so you comment on this if you, if you can, but uh, I'd be really interested in, in, in knowing if there's any plans afoot to try to look at those two trajectories. You know, what could you achieve by way of sort of this communication, art and science? What might we achieve by sort of going full tilt in biomimicry, and what could we achieve by very um, scale-specific and connectivity-oriented restoration? So I would say on each of those topics, pieces are going on at the moment. Uh, so we now have a Managing the Planet monthly seminar series at the Woodrow Wilson Center. So the second one was today. It was all around fresh water. Uh, 
There'll be another one March 23rd around the role of global forests. Uh, uh, and we're also seeing some of the managing of ecosystems to build up carbon stocks and living systems uh, actually starting all over the place, um, including in Department of Interior lands, for example. Uh, that just started maybe two weeks after the administration began, and I floated the idea. They just quietly started doing it. Uh, so all of this adds up, but I think the, the, the biggest issue, uh, well, the, the third point, uh, the kinds of stories uh, like the giant water lily uh, and the kinds of things that biomimicry has already brought us actually address a huge benefit uh, that's continually coming from the natural world uh, because it is a, a, an enormous living library about the life sciences. Uh, and none of that value is ever brought into how we run our economics. So I could tell you a story about a reaction that got a Nobel Prize in 1993, uh, responsible for the Human Genome Project, uh, revolutionizing uh, diagnostic medicine, et cetera, uh, all depending on a molecule from a bacterium from a Yellowstone hot spring. Uh, probably an economist who's worked on, on what is called the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, when I told him that story, he said that's got to be at least a trillion dollar benefit to humanity. So we need to figure out how to recalculate uh, those kinds of values and try and bring them more into the way we make our economic decisions. Uh, but I also, we've simply got to get people more sensitive to both the negative things that are going on and the positive things that can go on. Uh, so getting it more into the realm of art uh, is, I think, an essential thing to do. So when young people come to me and they say, well, I really care about the environment. Should I, you know, should I major in biology or do science? I say, you know, you should just follow your heart. And you can make as big a contribution as a poet or a lawyer or an economist as you can by being a field biologist. So just follow what you're happiest and going to be most successful at. Okay. So I know we have a reception, so maybe we ought to reserve any further questions for that. So we're about 8.10. Great. Thank you. <laughs>